Well, what a difference a few hours makes. This morning it was pouring rain and it was dark and dreary, and this afternoon when we left, the sun is out and it's nice and hot. What an amazing difference a few hours makes. I was talking to Nikki about that and just the idea that with storms, sometimes storms can kind of be discouraging, but the sun is always just not too far away. And I think there's a great lesson for us to learn with that, even with the storms of life. While things may look dark and dreary for a period of time, change is always just a little bit away through our Savior and our Father in heaven. And we're so thankful that we are blessed with the rain that we need, and we're so thankful that we have the sunlight this afternoon and this opportunity to come back and to study again, to sit at the feet of Jesus and to learn more about our Savior as we strive to be more like Him. Thank you for being here this afternoon. And indeed, I want to talk about our risen Savior for a few minutes tonight. I want us to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen, listen to some interesting words that Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke. When you think about Jesus, there are many titles or names that are given to him. When you look in Acts chapter 3, for example, and uh, as Peter was preaching to the Jews in Acts chapter 3, Peter described Jesus in a variety of ways. He described him as the Holy One, and he described him, I believe, as being righteous. When you look at John chapter 1, Jesus is referred to in verse 29 as the Lamb of God. He's referred to as the Word and the life and the life. In Isaiah chapter 9, a prophecy pointing to the days of Jesus, pointing to the Messiah, Isaiah spoke of Jesus as being the Prince of Peace. All throughout the Bible, we find these different terms and names given to Jesus. And certainly he is holy, he is righteous, he is the Lamb of God, he is the Word, he is the life and the light, and indeed he is the Prince of Peace. And because of his sacrifice, he has given men the opportunity to have peace through him. And yet there's an interesting passage in Luke chapter 12. And if you have your Bible, open it up please to Luke chapter 12. We find Jesus speaking here, and Jesus says something that should cause all of us to pause and to cause all of us to think for a few minutes. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus said something here that for some have said, well, maybe there's a contradiction in the scriptures. Because you mentioned that in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, that Jesus is referred to as the Prince of Peace. And yet when you look at Luke chapter 12 and beginning in verse number 49, we see that Jesus talks about this idea of division. And that Jesus did not come, that he did not come to bring peace rather, but, but division. And I want you to notice in Luke chapter 12, it's an interesting text here, where Jesus said in verse number 49, Jesus said this, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. How many times do we really think about Jesus as being a divider, about one who came to bring about division? I don't know if we really think about Jesus in that manner. And for some, some may be shocked to see that Jesus said, I didn't come to grant peace on earth. I came to bring about division. How do we reconcile this with other passages like Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, where Jesus is described as the Prince of Peace? Or what about the angels and what they said after the birth of Jesus? In Luke chapter 2 and verse number 14, as they spoke about the peace that now was made available. Well, I want to talk about that for a few minutes, and I want us to understand some things about our Savior Jesus. We are his disciples, we are his children, and the more we can know about him, the better our lives are going to be. And there are some valuable lessons here, but the one thing, the one thing I want you really to take home this afternoon is that we should view Jesus as a divider. He came, as he said, to bring about division. But how do we reconcile that with other passages? And how do we reconcile that with this idea that he came to bring about peace? Well, when you look in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is clear that Jesus indeed came to bring about peace. I want you to notice what the angel said to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 21. 
uh, before Jesus was born in Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 21, the angel said this to Joseph in Matthew 1 and verse number 21, talking about his wife or soon to be wife, Mary. She would conceive. And the Bible says in Matthew 1 and verse number 21, the angel said, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus came to save us from our sins, and certainly he came to bring about peace. Listen to the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 10 and in verse number 45. Mark chapter 10 and verse number 45, as Jesus spoke about his mission, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10 and verse number 45, Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus said, listen, I came to die. I came to give my life for everyone. And certainly I came to bring about peace. In Matthew chapter 11, I want you to notice the words of Jesus here. In Matthew chapter 11 in verse number 28. Matthew chapter 11, again, we're listening to Jesus. Matthew 11 in verse number 28, our Savior said this, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When you listen to the words of Jesus, he came to bring about peace. There's no mistaking, about, mistaking that. When you listen to the apostles, they make that very clear too. In Ephesians chapter 2, I want you to notice, in Ephesians chapter 2, what Paul reminded the Jews and Gentiles in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, what they had in Jesus Christ, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 13, as Paul had reminded them about who they used to be. In verse number 13, the Bible says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. And so even the apostles talked about the peace that Jesus came to bring. So how do we reconcile this, though, when Jesus said, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather to vision. How do we reconcile all of these passages? Well, very easy. Jesus indeed came to bring about peace. And he came to bring about peace so that we might have peace with our Heavenly Father in heaven. That's the peace that Jesus came to bring, that we may have a relationship, that we may obtain reconciliation, redemption, justification with our Heavenly Father in heaven, that we could be made right with our God in heaven. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1, I want you to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul here. Romans 5 and verse number 1, I want you to notice what Paul said here, talking about this peace and the idea that indeed the peace that Jesus came to bring was reconciling mankind to our Heavenly Father. And indeed, He has brought this peace. It is made available for everyone. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with who? With God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, indeed, Jesus came to bring about peace. And as we think about the peace that He came to bring, we need to understand that He came to bring about peace so that we could be made right with God. Peace so that we could have a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now, when you go back to our text in Luke chapter 12, or if you're looking here on the screen, there's something that really just stands out to us as we talk about this idea of Jesus bringing about peace for us. When you think about what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, I want you to notice something here. Jesus indeed brought about peace. And in order to bring us peace, in order for us to enjoy this peace, a peace that can surpass all understanding when we have and understand this relationship with our Father, Jesus would have to endure the cross. He would have to endure the death on the cross. Notice the language in verse number 50. He said, but I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed am I until it is accomplished. This baptism that he's talking about, he's not talking about John's baptism. And he's talking about a baptism in a figurative sense. He's talking about the anguish and the pain and the agony that he was going to experience on the cross. And when you think about the language that he used in the text where he said, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished, it paints the picture about how terrible the death of Jesus really would be and the amount of pain that he would endure on the cross. Why? 
so that you and I could have peace with our Heavenly Father in heaven. That word baptism is being used in a figurative sense to demonstrate that essentially he was immersed in pain, that he was overwhelmed with pain on the cross. Why did he do all of that? He did that so that we may be made right with our Heavenly Father in heaven. He endured the pain and the suffering for us. It's interesting in Luke chapter 9, when you turn over to Luke chapter 9, there's an interesting interaction here, and I think this will help us to see this idea of this baptism of suffering that Jesus is talking about. Jesus was with James and John, and they were uh, passing through Jerusalem or Samaria. And in Luke chapter 9, I want you to notice in verse number 51, it says, When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. That's actually not the right text. Turn over to Mark chapter 10, rather. Mark chapter 10, I want you to notice in Mark chapter 10, we see this language here dealing with this baptism of suffering. In Mark chapter 10, in verse number 35, I was singing about James and John in, in that passage there, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Mark chapter 10, I want you to see here, this idea that this baptism was talking about the suffering that he was going to endure and that he endured it for our benefit. James and John, in verse 35, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. I love that. They're saying, Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, Well, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? There it is again. Are you really able to do this, James and John? You don't know what you're really asking. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And so Jesus said, are you really ready to do this? And what we find he was talking about the suffering that he was going to endure on the cross, this baptism of suffering. And oddly enough, or maybe it's not as odd as we think it is, when you turn over to Acts chapter 12 and verse number 2, we see James, the brother of John. And indeed, James was able to drink that cup. And he was able to be baptized with the baptism that Jesus had received with respect to on the cross. In Acts chapter 12 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. You see, James and John had said, Listen, we're able to do this. And indeed they were. And I'm wanting you to see all of that just to show you that back in Luke 12, this idea of this baptism to undergo and how distressed I am, Jesus went through all of that. He went through all of that so that we could have peace with our Heavenly Father. You see, He came to bring about peace. He came to bring about salvation for the world. And brothers and sisters, let us never take for granted the sacrifice of Jesus. I was thinking about what Jerry was reading in John chapter 19 during the Lord's Supper and how Jesus had thorns in his head, and how he was beaten, and how he was mocked and humiliated. He indeed endured a baptism that brought about a lot of distress. He was overwhelmed with that pain, immense pain. But why did he do it? He did it so that we could be made right with our Heavenly Father. And if there is someone here tonight that is not enjoy the salvation and the grace that Jesus has to offer, then my friend, you are missing out on the one thing you really need. You can have peace with respect to your husband and wife or your family. You can have peace of mind knowing that maybe you have enough finances in your bank or peace of mind knowing that your job is secure. But if you are not right with Jesus Christ, if you are outside of Jesus, if you have not been reconciled to your heavenly Father, then you do not have real peace because you are still an enemy of God. And Jesus came to give us peace, to help us to have a relationship with God. So make no mistake about it, when you look at our text in Luke chapter 12, we need to understand that indeed Jesus did bring about peace. The peace that we need to understand, though, is that he brought about peace so that we could be made right with our Heavenly Father. But that begs the question or leaves the question, what do we do with Luke chapter 12? It is an interesting text 
when you really start in verse number 49. He says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division, for from now on five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. I've been thinking about this text for the last couple of weeks, and I will tell you verse number 49 is a powerful text. And I've been trying to figure out what exactly is Jesus saying here in verse number 49. Think about the language here for a second. I have come to cast fire upon the earth. Wow. What's that all about? How would you answer that? In what way did he come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish? Jesus said, I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. What's he saying here? And what's this idea of not having peace on earth, but rather division? I believe what Jesus is teaching in these verses here is showing us the effect of what will happen when people follow him. The effect of who he is and the effect of the teaching of the gospel message that when Jesus is taught, when people hear his words, it will often produce and create division. And those who follow him need to expect that they are going to encounter obstacles and challenges and even division among those who they may be closest to in their lives. I think, that, I think that's what Jesus is ultimately saying here. Let's look at verse number 49 because he said, I have come. He's talking about why he came here on earth. He said, I have come to cast fire upon the earth. Now, I don't believe Jesus is talking about hell here. I don't believe that at all. Now, I told you to go to Luke chapter 9. Now I want you to go back to Luke chapter 9 because of what James and John said here. In Luke chapter 9 and verse number 51 in Luke chapter 9 and verse number 51, as we talk about, what's he talking about in verse 49? In verse 51, it says, When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, this is unbelievable. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Jesus, you want us to kill these people? Because <laughs> we can do it, all right? We'll command fire from heaven. And Jesus, I get to see him, and he's probably just thinking, oh, man, how much more time do I have with these guys here? He turned and rebuked them. There it is. He said, what are you thinking? What are you saying? Have you not heard anything I've said my entire ministry? He turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Isn't that what we just got done reading in those other passages in the Gospels? Jesus said, I came to save men. I came to make men right with God, not to try to destroy them. And so when you go back to Luke chapter 12 and verse 49, this idea of coming to cast fire upon the earth, he's not talking about trying to send everybody to hell. I think what Jesus is saying here, and you guys can study this for yourself and you have a different view, then by all means let me know. I think what he's talking about here is the effect that the gospel message would have and what would happen as a result of his teaching and the, the decisions and the way that people would respond to Jesus and to his message. Some have said that this is referring to the judgment of the wicked. Fire is often indicative of judgment. The judgment of the wicked and the purifying of the righteous. Certainly with Jesus, his words, they produce separation. They produce division. People will have to make a choice on whether or not they will follow Jesus or whether or not they will not listen to him. And so this idea of casting fire upon the earth, I don't believe it's talking about literal fire, but I think this is the outcome or the response with respect to Jesus and his teaching, his message, the gospel being proclaimed, and the judgment upon those who would not listen and the purifying of those who would, and a separation that ultimately would take place. Listen, that's what the teaching of Jesus does. It produces separation. It produces division. Jesus came to save all men. But brothers and sisters, and this is something a lot of people don't always think about with Jesus, the teaching of Jesus often will produce division. Not because it's not correct or not because it's not true, because it forces people to make a decision. The law of excluded middle, we've been talking about that in our Bible class. 
And we got to make a decision. Will we either follow Jesus or will we reject his words? Before he even died, Jesus was already producing division. Not in a bad way, but just because of the things that he said. And the things that he did, there was division already taking place in his family. When you turn over to John chapter 7, I want you to notice the brothers of Jesus. In John chapter 7 and verse number 1, the Bible says, After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths was near. Therefore his brother said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. There was division even among his own family. Was he the Messiah? What, was he saying the things that were true? And that's what will often happen with respect to Jesus and his teaching. His teaching creates division. Who he is creates often division. And it forces people to make a decision about whether or not they will serve him, whether or not they will believe in him and follow him. It is interesting. You want to try something? Bring up Jesus one day in a conversation and just see how people respond. Jesus produces so many emotions in people. Some, it's good. But for many people, it's negative. And Jesus and his teaching. When you go back to Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, listen, division is going to happen. He said, I did not, he said, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Jesus said, don't be surprised when division happens to you. Even to those that you may be closest to your own family, your own spouse, your parents, your brothers. He said, this is what is going to happen. And I think, brothers and sisters, we need to understand, and maybe we need to think about Jesus in this sense a little bit more, that indeed he is a divider in the sense that when it comes to following him, division will often occur. And what Jesus is asking us as his disciples he is asking us that we put him first, that we are so loyal to him that we will follow him no matter what. One of the take-home points, if you want some application for, your, for yourself tonight, is this, is that discipleship is costly. Jesus is making that very clear. Following Jesus is always going to come with a price. When you turn over to Matthew chapter 10 and verses 20 and 21, as Jesus was talking to his apostles in Matthew chapter 10, as he was getting ready to send them out and what would happen to them in Matthew chapter 10, verses 21 and 22, Jesus said, brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and child will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Jesus said, make no mistake about it. You are going out in my name and you are representing me. You need to be prepared. That opposition is going to come your way. And what he's trying to get us to see tonight, my friends, is that indeed discipleship is costly. And yeah, we could describe him as Jesus the divider. Indeed, he is the Prince of Peace, and he is the light, and he is the life. But he also said that he came to bring about division. And that will happen when we seek to follow him. In Matthew chapter 10, I believe this is a parallel text to Luke chapter 12, although it doesn't talk about this idea of Jesus casting fire upon the earth. In Matthew chapter 10, in verse number 34, Jesus said this, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And he's using again, he's speaking figuratively with this idea of a sword. He's not talking about us harming people physically or anything like that. But what does a sword do? It cuts, it separates, it divides things. And that's what he's saying will happen with respect to his teaching and those who will follow him. Separation often will occur. He said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. It's interesting, because he's quoting from Micah chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. Before the Assyrians would come and take the people, 
Micah said those similar words. And ultimately, Micah was trying to get the people to, to ultimately trust in the Lord. And Jesus is ultimately reminding his disciples and reminding us, listen, difficult days are going to come if you decide to fully serve me. And you got to make sure that you put me first and ultimately trust in me. He said in verse number 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Think about that for a second. Who is more worthy to love outside of your mom and dad? Who's higher than your mom or dad? God. And that's what Jesus is trying to get them to see. You serve me, you put me first because I'm God in the flesh. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're not worthy of me as a disciple. And he said, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is reminding us, brothers and sisters, and young people, you need to hold on to this. Those who are new to the faith, hold on to this. Jesus says, you need to be absolutely loyal to me. Even if it means that division happens in your own household. Even if it means you will lose certain relationships. You know what? It may be better that certain relationships are all just severed. Because sometimes those can get in the way of us fully serving the Lord. Jesus said, I have to be first. Division and hatred will often occur in our homes, and it may not just be in our homes. We will experience this from the world. And this is so contrary to the world. You know, today, everybody wants tolerance. Tolerance. You believe everything to be true, and you can't say anything is wrong or false, and just accept everything to be true. Everybody is supposed to be tolerant with everything, and people want a Jesus. They want Jesus to allow any and everything. His teaching will not do that. Rather, his teaching will produce division. Think about what Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Those are powerful words. And those words force each and every one of us to make a choice. They're either true or they're either false. They can't be both. And if they are true, then what does that mean for all of those who are not following Jesus? All of those who are outside of Jesus, what does that mean? Well, it means that they're not right with their Heavenly Father. And see, those words will often upset people. But those words, nonetheless, are still true. Jesus came and he brought truth to mankind. In John 8 and verse 31 and 32, Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. But brothers and sisters, not everyone is interested in the truth. And the question for us tonight is, how interested are you in the truth? How interested are we with respect to the truth? There are many who just simply want to live in the dark and are refusing to follow Jesus. Turn over to John chapter 3, and I want you to notice in verse number 19. John chapter 3, when you look at the words uh, in John chapter 3 and verse number 19, listen to what the Bible says here. The Bible says, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought by God. Many are content to simply stay where they are in the dark and to ignore the light that has come. And the question for us is, what are we going to follow? Who are we going to follow? We can describe Jesus as being a divider. And when you really think about following Jesus, and this is why it's so important for us not to rush into a decision, but make sure we understand what we're doing when we say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus said, you are going to have division in your life. Family is going to maybe come against you. And you're going to, be, you're going to have challenges in front of you. But you have to follow me no matter what. And I will tell you how serious this is, my friends. And we have to make a decision. That's what the teaching of Jesus does. It forces us to make a decision. And think about this for a second. And this will sound mean, probably. But we are either going to be sons of God or sons of the devil. That's it. The law of excluded middle, we're talking about that in class. We're either going to be sons of God 
And Jesus says, I want you to be a son of mine. I want you to be a son of my heavenly father. But if you're not a son of God, then you are a son of the devil. Now, let me give you book, chapter, and verse. In John chapter 8, you remember what Jesus said here. And this is why the teaching of Jesus is so controversial. This is why it often produces division, because it is not convenient, because it is tough, because it forces people to make a decision. In John chapter 8 and verse number 42, Jesus was talking to religious people. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father. You hear this? You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, do you not believe me? You talk about creating division, <laughs> telling somebody you're the fa- your, your father is the devil. Well, that's exactly right, because they weren't following the father. And they were rejecting Jesus. It's no wonder that they wanted to stone him by the end of the chapter. He said, your father is the devil. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. His teaching produces division. And so we have to make a, cho- a choice. Who are we going to serve? If we serve Jesus, my friends, make no mistake about it, you will have peace. You will have peace in knowing that you are right with your heavenly Father. But at the same time, we will also have to expect division and problems to arise. And so Jesus is asking us, where will our allegiance be? Are we willing to forsake all? Are we willing to be like James and drink the cup of suffering? Are we willing to be like James and be baptized with the baptism of Jesus to the point of death? Are we willing to put him first, even if it means losing mother and father, husband or wife, son or daughter? My friends, we can have peace right now knowing that we are right with Jesus. But let us never sacrifice the peace that we have with our father to have peace with mankind right now. Because if we sacrifice that peace with our Heavenly Father to have peace with men and women or family members today, we don't have true peace because we've lost the the peace that we need. Jesus is telling all of us and reminding all of us we got to make a choice. If you serve me, I'll give you peace. And if you serve me now, even though you will go through obstacles, you will have a home waiting for you in heaven one day. Jesus could be called by many names. And maybe we can describe him also as the divider, because he came to bring about division. Let's make sure that we serve him no matter what we face in this life. If you are a child of God, and many of us, and not all of us here tonight, are children of God, you listen to the words of Jesus and hold on to them even in the face of opposition. You may be the only one in your family serving the Lord. You continue to serve God no matter what. And if you do, you'll be blessed. If you're not a child of God, You need to really think about serving him. He will give you peace. He will give you eternal life. But it will come with a price. But if you're willing to accept that and to forsake all, he invites you to come right now as we stand and sing.